And so we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like it's about 11.15 right on the dot. So we'll go ahead and get started this afternoon. Welcome, my name is Rhonda Jackson and I'm with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration uh, based in the Philadelphia office and I'm with the Office of Regional Operations. We are delighted to have you here today uh, for this very exciting session and panel discussion that's been set up uh, to talk about collegiate recovery. Um, so we hope that there is, there'll be a lot of information shared um, and we definitely know that you will find it um, useful and helpful um, as, you're, as we're talking about this topic. And we have a great panel of presenters that we'll introduce to you shortly. Um, so what we do wanna start off with is knowing who's in the room. Um, so the first thing I will, I will kick off as we do that is that we also have a poll that you probably would have seen when you were joining the session. So we wanna know a little bit about what you know about collegiate recovery. So as we're getting started today, if you could fill out that poll and let us know where you are on the spectrum. Uh, we've got a, a range of information available, something for everybody. Uh, so let us know uh, wh where you are and what you know about collegiate recovery before we get started. And we'll be able to use that to make sure uh, we're giving you great information today. Um, we'll also be taking questions. If you have questions, please do feel free to enter those questions in the chat. Uh, we'll be taking a look at those um, during the session as well, and, and hopefully we'll have time to answer those at the end and as we go through the session. So certainly, please do feel free to uh, enter that information in the chat as well. And so having said that, um, once again, if you, if you have any questions, you can enter those in the chat. We'll take those, and then we're going to have our presenters today that are going to give us a little bit of information about the, uh, the history of collegiate recovery. And then we're gonna hear about four great programs um, that talk about collegiate reco recovery as well. Um, and so along with that, we'll also um, hear some examples of what's being done in other states across our region. So you can also in the chat, let us know where you're from so we can see what states you're from. Uh, we'd like to know what part of the region you're coming from, maybe from across country, maybe in the mid-Atlantic states. So you can also put in the chat what region you're from as well, or your state or your community. Um, so that we can also shout you out. So having said that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And so, like I said, we have our poll and we're gonna give that another second to get started. Um, and so, and we'll also start um, going through the overview of the session and the little history. But before we do that, is our poll ready? Let's see if some of you have been able to fill out our poll. And I know that we were asking if some of you were familiar and have programs on your campus, if others have never heard quite of collegiate recovery and are coming here to learn something new today. So just trying to get an idea of who's in the room. Let's see. A hundred percent oh, and growing have not heard much about collegiate recovery programs and here to learn more, which is great. This is the place that you want to be certainly. So thank you so much for that. And even if you work with a program or don't have a program, plenty of opportunity to learn something today, certainly. So thank you very much for that. So that really helps to set the tone. So without further ado, and me, and me uh, we're gonna get into the meat of this um, as we see all these exciting faces joining. And so I'll now turn it over to Susie Mullins, who's with the West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network that will start um, our program off today and begin to share a little bit about collegiate recovery and jump right into those topics that you mentioned of wanting to learn more about the program. So thank you, Susie. Thank you, Rhonda. And that's really exciting. I always like to uh, have an audience of people who've never heard of collegiate recovery before. Um, I, I wish I kept a little ticker so that I would have a running list of all the people that you know we've exposed to this topic uh, over the years. Um, are the slides, can we put the slides up please? And while we're getting those slides set up, I'll just say, I see folks coming in from Louisville, Kentucky. We've got North Carolina that we've got in the chat. Um, so we've got some representatives, so neighbors to West Virginia uh, as well. <laughs> so thanks for sharing your uh, location. Thank you, Dave, for putting those slides up. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. Next slide. 
And uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about the West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network in a few moments. You can go to the next slide, please. So what is collegiate recovery? Um, collegiate recovery is a college or university-based um, supportive environment within the campus culture that reinforces the decision to engage in a lifestyle of recovery from substance use. Um, I need to, to make some alterations to this slide because in recent years, collegiate recovery programs have really become more inclusive and more expansive to include um, not only substances, but other um, behavioral type addictions. And many of our programs welcome and embrace allies to recovery. Uh, and allies can be individuals who are impacted by somebody else's use. It could be a sibling, could be a parent, uh, could be friends. Um, so we really want to create that environment that is, is open and inclusive of many individuals who are there you know, to support each other um, and to get support for themselves. Um, collegiate recovery is also designed, excuse me, to provide an educational opportunity integrated alongside recovery support. I'm getting a message that someone doesn't have audio. Should I pause a minute? I think we hear you, Susie. I think okay. we're okay. Oh, okay. Good. All right, great. Next slide, please. So why bring recovery to campus? Folks might ask this question, what does this have to do with, with higher education? Um, and higher education is uniquely abstinence hostile environment for abstinence based recovery, but also other forms of recovery. Um, there are a lot of, I think, misconceptions about uh, the, the amount of substance use on campuses. We know from various surveys and studies that the vast majority of students don't misuse substances, but what we see in the media often, you know, would lead us to, to think otherwise. At the same time, uh, we do have to recognize that many of our campuses promote a culture that encourages substance use and, you know, in some ways reinforces um, rewards uh, and, and normalizes um, a high level of using substances. And for someone who's in recovery and abstinence-based recovery, ca those campuses just aren't safe and welcoming places. Uh, and, you know, as a, as a function of trying to be more inclusive, uh, I think that schools really need to be thinking about, uh, you know, serving all students. And that includes our recovering population of students. And this population is often unserved and in, in a lot of ways invisible and invisible for a lot of reasons. And stigma has a lot to do with that. Uh, with the um, expansion of collegiate recovery programs, we have seen more stigma work or anti-stigma work on campus and uh, an increasing visibility of the recovering population. So as we increase that visibility, we really need to make sure that those support services are there and that our campuses are safe. Um, collegiate recovery also meets educational, social, social support and structural support needs specific to the recovering population. Um, and it really comes down to the fact that it's the right thing to do. And I'm sure that um, Dr. Christine will talk a little bit more about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but that's something that has, uh, has been elevated in the very recent history of collegiate recovery programs. Next slide, please. So key dates and significant events. Um, collegiate recovery has been around since the late 70s with the first uh, known program being at Brown. Uh, and there have been a number of other early adopter programs. In 2002, the Association of Recovery Schools was formed by Rutgers, Texas Tech, and Augsburg. And the Association of Recovery Schools at that time included recovery high schools and collegiate recovery. They uh, separated a number of years later so that they could each focus on, you know, more specific their populations. But recovery high schools have been around uh, even longer than collegiate recovery programs and are quite plentiful around the state, around the country. Uh, again, a lot, a lot of uh, those programs people aren't aware of. Um, in 2005, Texas Tech received a replication grant uh, to, to replicate their curriculum and help other people, you know, give them a, a blueprint, so to speak, 
or um, at least a document to draw from how to do what Texas Tech did, how to replicate the Texas Tech model. In 2010, the uh, first Collegiate Recovery Conference was held and uh, the Association of Recovery and Higher Education was created and ARHE was incorporated the following year. And I know that uh, Dr. CJ is gonna talk more about ARHE and our regional presence. In 2012, there was a, a significant influx of um, awareness and funding made available for the creation of collegiate recovery programs by the Stacy Matheson Foundation, which, which later became Transforming Youth Recovery. And her original goal was to fund 100 schools at $10,000 each, uh, you know, not a small sum of money. And so a lot of our programs, um, two of the programs in West Virginia were selected and received those $10,000 seed grants, which you know, really sends a message to the, the institution um, that this is, uh, is something to focus on. Uh, so in 2012, with all of that uh, promotion and influx of funding, we started to see a, a tremendous growth of efforts to get collegiate recovery programs started. Between 2012 and 2021, multiple states have had statewide or regional expansion projects. And three of those states uh, are in our mid-Atlantic region. And um, New Jersey, uh, when Governor Chris Christie was, uh, when he was the governor, he put into effect a requirement for the state schools to um, have uh, support services available for students if they had a residential population of 25% or more. Um, our state, West Virginia, and, uh, and our neighbors in Virginia have received state opioid response funding uh, to expand collegiate recovery. So that's, that's been tremendous. And of course, North Carolina was a very early, early leader with that. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about the program that I work for in our structure. So we have an alliance, of the alliance for the Economic Development of Southern West Virginia, and 10 schools in the southern part of our state came together, and the presidents created this alliance. Uh, one of the focus areas of the alliance is addiction, recovery, and reentry. And so they, uh, when the state opioid response funding became available, uh, they wanted to um, promote recovery by applying for SOAR funds. And uh, so we were awarded in 2019 and that's how our network got started. Next slide, please. So these are the 10 schools and the schools in Teal are the schools where we provide funding for a peer recovery support specialist. And that really helps with the institutional support to have staff uh, because we have a number of, of basic recommendations and best, best practices and a dedicated staff person is one of those recommendations. So through our state opioid response grant, we're able to um, provide staff on these seven campuses. And the other three campuses are also making efforts uh, in this direction. Next slide, please. So just briefly, how did we do it? We work with seven schools. We partnered with three behavioral health centers and those behavioral health centers hire these peer support specialists. Uh, we all work together. It's, it's kind of a, an extensive supervision structure, but um, it, it really is beneficial because we're, we're embedded also in the community and our peer support specialists can, can be ambassadors, not only for collegiate recovery, but for their schools out into the community of people in recovery. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And I know that there's a, a lot of uh, words on this page and you can download the slides and look at those later, but uh, just a, a quick map so you can get a visual of where these efforts are being undertaken around the state. Our network also provides technical assistance, education, training, consultation type services for schools outside of our network. And we collaborate closely with West Virginia University and some of the other schools around our state. Next slide, please. You can go on to the next one. 
And this is just a, a very brief graphic to show some of the things that we've accomplished over the last year. Um, we uh, have been very active in doing naloxone training and helped create a virtual naloxone training. Uh, we've been really active in re training recovery allies uh, to try to build our programs. Next slide, please. This is also a series that we've started, uh, Overcoming Barriers to Higher Education, and we have a six-part series that we're working on to try to attract people um, to higher education and reaching people that, um, that are in recovery that might not realize that we have support on so many campuses across our state. Next slide. And you can go through the next several slides here. I've just um, put these up. These are projects recently that we've collaborated on. There was a re-entry day and we focused on education. Next slide. We have a Recovery Matters interview series uh, where we're interviewing people from uh, all across the state that work in recovery to help promote recovery. And this is uh, one of our peer support specialists at Concord University. Next slide. We um, partnered with some other folks on Women in Recovery Day, and we had speakers every 15 minutes. Uh, so we had 15 or 16 speakers from across the country, and this is our, um, our student peer at Marshall who participated and spoke that day. Next slide. And I always like to include this, uh, this quote from Patrice Salmeri, who's one of our early pioneers and really gets to the crux of why we do what we do, because no one should have to choose between recovery and a college education. Next slide. Thank you. And actually, thank you very much for sharing that overview and just really sharing from, the, from 2002, so just in the last 19 years, how much the network has grown and transitioned during that time and hopefully for those that are uh, here to learn new information, I um, found that timeline and, and just range of the program very helpful. And so what I'm going to do now, thank you, uh, Susie Millens, for providing us that information overview about West Virginia. I'm actually going to, I'm going to, sh I'm going to shift and go to actually Dr. Christine uh, De Jesus, Seuss, excuse me, uh, who is with the Montclair State University right before we go to the University of Delaware. And so I'm gonna ask Christine to come on. She's one of our speakers today to talk about her program. We've heard a little bit about West Virginia. So now let's hear, hear, hear from Dr. Christine. Of course, <laughs> 2020 and 2021 and our uh, interesting experience of not uh, taking ourselves off mute. So sorry for that little pause there. So yes, I'm Dr. Christine De Jesus. I'm from Montclair State University in New Jersey. Um, and our collegiate recovery program has been actually in existence since about 2012. Um, it's interesting the changes we've made since um, the pandemic, everything is switched virtual, and we'll be talking about that. But we really began um, our collegiate recovery program just creating a, a physical space um, for our students in recovery, just a, an opportunity for them to talk about their experience of being a person either in recovery or seeking recovery. And so I think it's really important as we're, you know, as we're talking about this process and moving forward, just understanding that collegiate recovery looks really different across campuses and our campus at Montclair State had really humble beginnings. It was literally just an hour a week of providing supports for our students. Um, and we are one of the recipients of the um, of the grants that have come from the the um, I'm sorry I'm a little slow today from uh, Governor Christie's initiatives back in which um, in 2015 mandated that we um, we any college campus with 25 percent of their students residing on campus was required to uh, provide recovery housing and recovery support services for our students. Unfortunately, our funding didn't come until the pandemic, so it's looked quite interesting in how we've been able to utilize that, but we've been building in, you know, increasingly more recovery supports for our, our students in recovery. Um, and, and what that looks like really depends on the students. 
uh, similar to Susie in, in, in West Virginia, we've provided you know, peer recovery supports. Um, we have provided different opportunities for our students to connect and grow both social and academic. Um, and yeah, so that's a little bit about our program and what we do here in New Jersey. Um, as we're talking, I think later in the, in the program, we'll be talking more specific about how that looks, particularly in a, in a time of digital awareness and, and access. Thanks for your time. All right, thank you for, for sharing a little bit about what's happening in New Jersey. And so now we're gonna move down the road again and go south to Delaware uh, with Ms. Jessica Esta, who's going to tell us about the University of Delaware um, and an overview so you can see we're traveling all around the East Coast here. So I'll turn it over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Hi everyone, I am so excited to share about collegiate recovery with a group of, of people who have never heard of it before. So that's something that's really exciting for me. Uh, the University of Delaware's collegiate recovery community began in 2014. We were a recipient as well of the Transforming Youth Recovery Grant. So that was a great way for us to get started. And we also had some humble beginnings. Um, I came to the University of Delaware in 2011, and for the 10 years prior to that, I had worked in community mental health, working specifically with the drug and alcohol population um, and persons in recovery. So when I got to the university, I said, so where, where are the resources for our students in recovery? And everybody just kind of looked around. Um, and they said, well, you know, we have drug and alcohol counselors. We have the counseling center as well. And I said, okay, so we're not doing specific outreach though, because we know that they're here and we know that we have students that are struggling as well. So I, I've received uh, kind of the go ahead to go and ask some questions on some of the assessments that we use on campus. And I learned that between one to 2% of our population identifies as being in recovery from drug and alcohol use specifically. So again, I have a, a wonderful director that I work for and she said, go ahead, see what you can do uh, for a collegiate recovery on our campus excuse me, collegiate recovery community on our campus. I put up some posters and I had two interested students right off the bat. From those two students, um, we now have about 30 students that are on our email list and we have just around 15 students who are actively engaged with us on a weekly basis, chatting about recovery, chatting about what it's like to be a student in recovery on our campus, um, talking about their successes, talking about their challenges, um, and it's been a beautiful journey to, to be a part of and to witness. Um, let's see. So we are community-based. So what that means for our campus is we rely on peer support. It's really about providing this brave space, the safe space for our students to talk with each other, to connect with each other, and to realize that they aren't doing this alone. Part of our mission has also been to really break down any barrier that we uh, can encounter so we allow students to enter our recovery community at any point in their journey. They don't have to be already abstinent from drugs and alcohol to be a part of, of our community. Uh, we have students who have abstinence as the goal, but they are not quite there yet. And we've found that that has worked really well on our campus. We have students that I think the, the longest we've had was about 10 years in sobriety. And then we have students who are just entering, as I just said. As we've already mentioned, we also are open to allies. So about every semester, we have one or two students who are interested just in becoming advocates. And that has worked well for us as well because there is such a stigma associated with drug and alcohol use and along with recovery that oftentimes our students don't wanna go out and do events because they don't wanna put their face to it. And our advocates have nothing to lose. So our advocates are the ones that are out there and doing classroom programs and training and doing events for our campus. We are also open to students who have been impacted by the addiction of any close friend or close family member. And that has created an interesting dynamic in our community as well, because they can see the perspective of the students who are then struggling with uh, drug and alcohol addiction. And that oftentimes produces a lot of empathy for the students who have been addicted by the addiction of a, a close friend or family member. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. And so now we're gonna keep going south down 95 and go to North Carolina, uh, A&T, which is actually, and then we, we go west a little bit. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. 
uh, Dominique Clemens James, who's going to tell us what's happening at North Carolina a and And then she's also going to tell us a little bit about the regional network. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. CJ. Clemens James is really long to say. So um, I'm Dr. CJ. I'm at North Carolina a and State University, which is a historically Black college slash university. It's an HBCU. Um, and so we have a pretty different take on collegiate recovery um, on our campus. And so I I really, you know, commend all of us for coming together on the panel today because we all have very diverse um, collegiate recovery programs and how we approach it. And since none of you have ever heard of collegiate recovery, I'm glad you're getting a full gamut of things. Um, so with that, um, Aggies for Recovery is the name of our collegiate recovery community. Um, we started in 2014 um, with a physical space. Um, some 12 step meeting availability weekly and whatnot. Um, and as a historically black college, um, we our population is predominantly African American and people of color, um, which is one of the harder populations to not only reach, but to serve in um, any type of recovery services or addiction services, um, or even mental health services. Um, our program is under the umbrella of our counseling services center, which kind of strengthens are just kind of overall reach and ability to serve in different pockets um, because a lot of our students, while they won't just openly identify as being in recovery or considering their substance use, they will identify, you know, in the counseling center with their own therapist and will, you know, at, go home and find us through a referral. Whatnot. Um, so we started in 2014 under a grant. We were one of six pilot schools in North Carolina to receive a grant from the governor to establish and start a collegiate recovery program. And we were the first HBCU to do that as well. Um, present day. So with that, you know, establishing a brand, establishing our name, a logo, finding a location, outfitting that location, and then obviously promoting that to build campus awareness for our students. Um, led us to a huge um, just kind of discovery that populations such as these, especially on college campuses, aren't necessarily, that, now I won't say, un, I won't necessarily say they, won't, they aren't aware of recovery, just what that means and what that could look like. Um, so a lot of our work is very psychoeducation based. Um, we don't have a formal membership for our students. Um, we are all inclusive to everyone on campus. So that's students who identify as being in recovery, students who don't, students who are just contemplating um, their substance use or their behavioral um, addiction, um, as well as allies and students affected by, you know, family members and close friends who also experience addiction. Next slide, please. Next slide. There we go, thank you. Um, so we do offer weekly programming um, as things, such as things like um, our smart recovery meeting. Um, we chose to go that more of that route instead of um, a regular 12 step, simply because we also found with our population of students, they're very independent, they're very autonomous and they like a self-help approach best. Um, and smart recovery just kind of offers that self-regulation area. Um, so it really speaks to them. Um, but we do have four focal areas that are kind of like the pillars of our program, which is obviously um, substance use, misuse, as well as behavioral addiction, like eating disorders, gambling, um, sex addiction, porn addiction, video games, things like that, um, as well as social skills. Um, that one kind of came about because a lot of our students who are either just kind of trying to change their lifestyle around or really do something about their use, we're finding that a lot of their social interaction was based on their use, unfortunately. And the social skill area was lacking in learning how to make new friends, how to connect with people and so on and so forth, as well as a wellness awareness piece. Um, R&B relaxation is one of our more popular weekly programs simply because people talk about self-care and they talk about being well, but they don't ever have the experiences available to do them. Um, and so we definitely incorporated that into our program as well. Um, along with these focal areas, we hold a very inclusive definition of recovery. So not only substance use, behavioral addiction, but also things like trauma and severe emotional distress, as well as, you know, adjusting to a new accessibility concern. If 2020 was trash, you know, things like that. So allowing people to take recovery and run with it and give it their own personal definition is helpful. It also normalizes those that, you know, kind of review 
um, recovery traditionally as you know being a part of like okay you understand my language you're just applying it to something else um, so that also lends itself to multiple pathways and alternate pathways for recovery as well as helping our students not only navigate college life and student life as a person in recovery but also preparing them for when they you know go out into the world and they don't have a structured recovery program just yet all right, and I will share my screen to talk a bit more about ARHE. Okay. There we go. So I am also the um, Mid-Atlantic Regional Representative for the Association of Recovery and Higher Education. Um, we do have, you know, collegiate recovery programs. I want to say we have about 193 and growing every day. Um, I mentioned we were the first HBCU. We have at least three or four now that are starting. Um, and so ARHE is kind of an integral part of those things because it's kind of like a nice overview guide to you know, developing your program, getting you resources, helping you network, um, as well as just offering support and encouragement. Um, as a Mid-Atlantic representative, um, I personally, I hold a drop-in hour once a month just to kind of see how programs are doing, especially now since everything's virtual and attendance may not be up as high as we'd like and morale may be low and things of that nature, just to have a space for people to come, get ideas, get support, and then go back to their programs with them. But um, this is the um, ARHE website. It is at collegiaterecovery.org. Um, and so here you can find just things about ARHE, who there are, who our student ambassadors are, who's on our board, um, you can join us either as an institution if you're trying to start your program at a college or as a professional if you just kind of want to learn more about how to support um, students in collegiate recovery or, you know, be an asset to a collegiate recovery program. Um, and there's also various resources. We have a blog, we have um, volunteer opportunities, career things, student opportunities, especially um, because a lot of times are for our students in recovery, it may be a bit more difficult to you know, find opportunities that definitely suit um, their lifestyle and their um, career, their curriculum. Um, and things like that. And so with collegiate recovery specifically, um, if you wanted to learn more in depth about the history of collegiate recovery, um, want to just get more familiar with terminology or just kind of learn how to start a program, what, you know, needs may be, how to do an assessment on your campus or at your institution, um, as well as standards and recommendations and um, common FAQs we may have. So that's just a little bit about it. Um, our main goal is just to kind of support collegiate recovery programs and students involved with collegiate recovery to you know, expand it across the nation to make sure that every student on every campus has support. Thank you, Dr. CJ. And I'm gonna ask uh, that you also uh, drop that uh, website in the chat for those that may wanna look at that at a later time. Um, it's, we have uh, a lot of people that are interested in learning more, so I'm sure they'll find that website very helpful. We have moved from uh, looking at a well-developed network collegiate recovery program to a program that started with two, to a program that's in the middle, it sounds like, to a program based at HBCU. So you see there's wide variety in how this can be implemented. So I'm sure those resources will be very helpful. So now having, hearing all these different perspectives, um, as you're thinking about the program or looking into maybe starting one on your own campus, there's a few things we think might be helpful to hear about today. And one of which, um, is specifically looking at it from a digital use of technology. And so one of the questions I'll open up to learn more about today is to hear from all of the programs, uh, particularly in this time, as I think Dr. Christine started off by mentioning this, transitioning to um, being virtual and off campus, how has your program handled the transition from in-person to virtual support during this time period? You may have had some of that in place before, but how have you handled that transition? And I'm sure others would love to know some of the technology tools you've used in the past and are currently using and those apps you've mentioned. Um, if you're, and for our group, uh, our attendees that are listening, if you know of apps and things that you've heard of, put those in the chat too, if you wanna share what you've just heard, uh, we'd love to know what you're already looking at or know about. So having said that, I'm, I am gonna call on name because Dr. Christine, I saw you shaking your head very much so. So I'm gonna have you start off and then the others can join in. I'm gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> It's all good. Thanks so much. So, um, so Montclair, the only 
technology we were using prior to the pandemic was an app called Remind School Communications app. And that's the primary way that we were communicating with our students in recovery as a broad group. Um, and it's a pretty simplistic app. It's not very complicated, um, but it was serving our, our needs. Um, <laughs> With the pandemic, we had to make a complete and total shift um, in terms of recovery support services, which are pretty complex. So they come from sort of two different places. One is our collegiate uh, is our college counseling center. We offer um, recovery coaching as well as um, recovery count, you know, counseling grounded in in recovery support services. And so with the pandemic, we went from doing everything in person to offering all of our, our services via Zoom or Doxy. Um, I ended up choosing to use Zoom um, for our, our recovery counseling and recovery uh, coaching. And so that transition has been really interesting. Um, we've also, you know, in, in, in terms of the um, transition to, to online support services, our recovery support group. So we offer a weekly group called um, Recovery Room, which went from a once a week um, off offering to what we found is our students in recovery really were requiring much more support in, in context of the pandemic. Um, Montclair State University is a Hispanic serving institution and a minority serving institution. So 50% of our students on campus are identifying as students of color. Actually, it's, I think 51, we're just over that 50% mark. And so um, what we found is that our demand for services drastically increased. Um, so we had ended up offering recovery room twice a week. And then what we found is that again, being a minority serving institution um, and a Hispanic serving institution, our needs for students um, who are parenting drastically increased during that time. And what we found is that um, students who were either needing recovery support services or who were um, in recovery already and not just needing the services, but like needing much more um, access to resources, weren't able to access those resources from home digitally. And so what we created during this time was a group called parenting and recovery, because we wanted our students to be able to show up authentically as they were, not trying to pretend that they don't have children. And so um, when they were coming to our recovery room services, they were really in, you know, they were, they were managing multiple roles. And so wanting to create a space for those students, for them to come authentically with their kids as they were, um, you know, asking for whether it be recovery supports, whether it be treating whatever they needed to be able to come to the room authentic as they were. And so um, our need for services have like just drastically increased during the pandemic. We also found that our recovery support services um, in terms of social supports were drastically increased during this time. And so we, you know, because we had access to a grant and grant funding, we were able to offer things um, for our students like silly stuff that, you know, we just weren't able to offer during the pan, you know, prior to the pandemic, things like, um, oh, what was that? A, um, a murder mystery event or a spa day or just like silly, simple things that don't seem like a lot, but when you're a student in recovery and you, you're, you know, you have all these other pressures, being able to offer those, those opportunities online where people could do it from the context of their home made it really simplistic for them and really created a sense of community that we we just didn't have in person what we found is that you know with the digital access our our demand for recovery supports just flourished um and so it's interesting i think post pandemic we will probably keep much of these digital support systems going because what we found is that students couldn't come to our recovery meetings in between classes because they had all these other responsibilities. Whereas now our students are accessing them at e you know, with, with relative ease. And so it really has made for us um, realize that we just need to do so much more. So we're just like at the very beginning of this process of really expanding our digital supports for our students. Well, that's great. It sounds like it's really expanded some opportunities. How about others? Anyone else want to chime in on that? 
I'll go ahead. Um, so with, like I've mentioned, uh, we are an HBCU and so our students are very independent, very autonomous, very self-help based. And so while we would have some, you know, face-to-face -face interaction with our smart recovery meetings, you know, when we were in person, um, a lot of the times, you know, we are on an eight to five schedule and so are our buildings and oftentimes they lock. And, and it just like a student shouldn't have to choose between recovery and education, they also shouldn't have to choose between going to a meeting for support and being able to eat lunch or going to a meeting and or going to class. Um, and so before pandemic started, we were um, streaming our smart recovery meetings live on Instagram so that people could either chime in while they're in line at the cab, ask a question, make a comment on the video that we were monitoring or come back and watch it later, you know, so that they could get their, their recovery word and serving for the day, we like to call it. Um, and since the pandemic started, we were, um, our school system decided to go with Zoom and they bought the licensing and all that. And I was like, all right, great, that's fantastic. Um, because now we could, we expanded that idea, except now that we stream every bit of programming that we do. We stream our R&B relaxation group because not only do our students in recovery need it, our staff in recovery need it, or just our students and staff in general who need it. Um, it also just kind of opened up cross networking between collegiate recovery programs. Um, my program and the program at UNC Charlotte, we did a Zoomoween shenanigans so that our students could meet their students because they're not going to be at our schools forever. And it would be great to have people, you know, all across the map that you can get support from or you can call on or, you know, meet with, especially if, you know, travel to visit schools is not, you know, open right now. And a lot of our students go off to grad school. If you know that a grad school that you want to go to already has a collegiate recovery program and you're already familiar, you're in there and it's great. Um, so we've definitely expanded that. We hope we can host a lot more meetings during the day because of the tele, um, the tele uh, option, simply because, you know, I would love to have a drop-in space available all the time for students, even if they can't physically be with us. Um, another kind of not exactly technological innovation, but because our buildings on campus are still open um, a lot and our students are still on, some of our students are still on campus, we put out things like coloring sheets on our bulletin board that they can come pick up, pick, you know, care packages, things like that, just to let them know that the space is here. And because we still have incoming freshmen or incoming new students in recovery, they need to know where the physical space is anyway. So letting them know that this is here, you can come, whatever. And when we open back up, we'll be here waiting for you. But as far as the, you know, tele the innovation piece goes with the technology streaming live we do it now on instagram twitter and facebook all at once so that you know if instagram isn't their preferred if they're more old school and they like facebook they can join in they can chime in uh, we also use the polling technology on those platforms to get them to vote on you know our topic for smart recovery because no one likes to pull it out of thin air because no one really gets anything out of that and because we can't you know reach them and talk to them face to face we can put it out there and say, hey, what are y'all struggling with this week? So we can talk about it and bring it up and, you know, really talk about it and discuss it online for y'all. So that's the other way we've been doing things. So I've heard Zoom mentioned a couple of times. Thank you. So anybody using anything other than Zoom? So today is actually the one year anniversary of the kickoff of our virtual uh, peer support services. Um, and we utilized adaptive telehealth. That was a, a program uh, that I have used for a number of years and in a previous position um, worked on statewide expansion of telehealth and that was the platform that we made available. So um, for me, I was really fortunate to come to this work with a base in telehealth and ethical practice of telehealth. Uh, so we transitioned our team in 20 days from no telehealth experience of any of our peer support specialists to everybody having access to uh, a secure platform, uh, having uh, training, peer support specific uh, telehealth training. And I believe that we, uh, that Matrix has uh, one of the presenter trainers that we um, accessed and utilized uh, as part of the conference this year. Um, so over the last year, our participation with students has been 
um, very low. And part of the reason for that is, is that we didn't have existing communities to tie into on any of our campuses. We just started these programs. So we didn't really have a community to transition. Um, we have been trying to create these communities while in a pandemic through you know, a virtual platform, very challenging. So all of our groups are open to um, really anybody, students or non-students uh, in the community. And with our peers working for uh, community behavioral health centers, that also gives us a little more reach. Um, we have tracked some of the things that we have done in addition to our various groups, which I'll put a link up to our group schedule. Um, and it's day by day, you can open the schedule and see who's offering what. Um, but we, over the last year, have, have trained 447 people to administer naloxone. We've distributed 307 uh, naloxone kits, and many of those were distributed via mail through a partnership with a quick response team at one of our behavioral health centers. And uh, we've trained 586 people in recovery ally uh, curriculum. So uh, although our peer support individual services haven't been what we had hoped they would be, um, we've tried to be creative and you know, all of these things are offered virtually. So um, I did a session earlier today on remote overdose uh, prevention and we talked uh, extensively in that session about how we did, how we um, transitioned from in-person to virtual naloxone training. And I think we were the first, uh, first group to do that. And since then, many, many other groups have gone on um, to replicate that. So um, those are some of the things that, that we've done uh, with regard to the, the transition. And, and I'll add, I see a lot of, of, of comment um, just talking about the transition. You mentioned 20 days, uh, doing it just 20 days. It sounds like some of you may have had some other um, inroads into using some of that technology, but also just acknowledging that in the chat, there's a lot of information and questions saying, how do you evaluate this? How do you know it works? And so you're giving great feedback about how you're collecting this new data that you're sharing and tapping into and starting to bring forth some of the challenges. And Jessica, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. It looked like you were going to just add something to that. I was just going to say that we are one of the ones that are using Zoom as well. Um, since we are not providing clinical services, we didn't go the option of, um, we don't use the words like telehealth, uh, just because it's not clinical what we're doing. So we do use a HIPAA compliant Zoom because I wear many hats at the University of Delaware and, and part of what I'm doing is uh, more along the counseling route. Uh, but I, I still maintain that HIPAA Zoom with uh, my collegiate recovery community. As far as our transition, we kind of saw the writing on the wall as we were heading into the shutdown. So we were lucky enough to have that conversation in our last in-person meeting. So our students knew what was going to happen. It knew that at any point we could get the message from the university that we needed to shut everything down and that whatever subsequent meeting after that would be held through Zoom and I would be sharing that link with them. Other than Zoom, we've tried playing some games. I know lots of collegiate recovery communities have had success with online game nights. We did not. <laughs> I guess our students just weren't into that, but we did try. Um, and then we also use the GroupMe app. So that's the other kind of tech thing that we use. And, and we use that to stay connected with each other at times when we're not having our official meetings. As soon as we faced the shutdown, we knew that we needed to increase our support as well. So we went from having two meetings a week to having five meetings a week at various times of the day and at various days of the week. So that way we can be sure that we were capturing all of the students that we needed to capture. Thank you for, thank you for that. So we've heard about some of the, the positives that already you started to talk about. You've had more, you had more success in reaching out to some groups that maybe you wouldn't have and flexibility in times. So uh, any other challenges and, and uh, excuse me, successes and or challenges that you uh, experienced while doing things digitally um, and modifying your programs that you'd wanna share uh, as tips for the group? Absolutely. Um, off the bat, um, we experienced a lot of what Jessica experienced was, you know, they just wouldn't show up to game night, even though Jackbox games are great. Um, <laughs> They wouldn't show up for that. They didn't want to watch movies. It was more so we found that our students became Zoomed out very quickly. Um, like Zoom became this formality thing where it's just like, okay, 
I have to go to class on Zoom, so I have to look presentable. I have all my counseling appointments and my telehealth appointments are on Zoom, so I have to, you know, be this way and be that way. It's like having to attach a mindset to present yourself, and that can get tiring and emotionally fatiguing, especially if you've got Zoom meetings back to back, because now people think you're accessible 24 hours and can squeeze in every meeting. <laughs> and so that was a real, re one of the real reasons we decided to stream our stuff too, was because it's a lot easier to just kind of be here and scrolling and seeing, oh, my program did something. Let me tap the, the volume up and watch it for a little bit or maybe bookmark it and come back. It's, it feels more like a choice instead of it being thrust upon them at that point. So that was definitely a barrier we encountered. No one shows up to Zoom. We still offer it, but they're mostly watching us live. And I'll, I'm sorry, Dr. Christine, were you gonna add something? No, okay. And so in thinking about those challenges, and you can also share successes and challenges as we go through, what are some of the, thinking of health equity, because I know we're, we're continuing to talk about that and wanting to make sure um, that we're, we're, we're having health e equitable health access. In what ways have you seen and used this technology to create access to diverse populations? Um, so just share a little bit about that. I think for at least at Montclair, I think, you know, I, we're all still in pandemic mode and because we have, you know, a very diverse student body, I think they have been accessing, at least on our campus, stuff via Zoom much more than we had ever expected. And they're still using it pretty consistently. They haven't, um, we haven't seen that, that runoff of like where they, they've, not been able to access or not wanted to access. But I think one of the things that, and at least on our program, what we've done, and I love what Dr. CJ has done on her campus of, of streaming stuff. I think that is spectacular. And I'm like, I'm, now I'm like in my head, I'm like, okay, how do we make this a thing when we don't really use our social, uh, our social media very much. But one of the things that we've done is we've really made it very clear to our students that while we're using Zoom, they don't need to be on screen right? They can just be there with their cameras turned off and that's okay. And it really has created an opportunity for discourse for our students when they're not on, on camera. Um, just to talk about, even though we've let them know that they don't need to be on camera at all, um, talking about why it is, you know, whether it's they're struggling with what's happening in the world today and they just don't feel like they can be seen, right? And so it creates this opportunity to talk about, okay, let's talk about the trauma that's going on in the world and how do we be present for you and how do we support you in that? You know, whether it be, you know, I think I had mentioned spa day, one of our students, um, it really created an opportunity not being on, cam you know, not on camera talking about how hard it is to be present in the world right now. Um, and that they were doing some time for self-care and they were like, I don't want to be on camera because I'm, I have a mask on and I don't want you all to see me being, you know, <laughs> with a green face. Um, and it really created this opportunity to sort of talk about what's going on for them in their world and how they need to do different things for self-preservation in this time where the world is really, you know, painful and chaotic for so many. Um, you know, the parenting and recovery group really came because it came as a thing because we had a student who um, needed substance use disorder treatment and couldn't get it because she had small children at home. Um, and so really thinking about like, while we can't provide her the treatment she needs, how do we create, you know, how to create supports for students like her and so many others who because of health inequity, right? And we often don't think, particularly for related to substance use disorder, we don't think about the complications that women experience um, parenting. And so while we called our group Parenting and Recovery, it's primarily women <laughs> um, who are utilizing the resource, but really just thinking about the ways in which we don't show up for our students with diverse needs has really been helpful and has allowed us to create different opportunities for whether it be discourse or program creation for them. Would anyone else like to add to that? Go ahead, Jessica. Okay. 
I'll be brief. <laughs> I think it has created an ease of access for lots of pockets of our students. They don't have to get up, walk across campus, make sure that they're dressed right, make sure they have their face on, like all the things that they don't have to do to show up anymore. We also don't require that they have their camera on for any number of reasons, including it is, it's very vulnerable to have a camera on and to let people see in your space, right? So there, there's been a lot of challenges as well. So while it's increased the, the ability for students to attend, broken down barriers, um, also, it's broken down the barrier of just the anxiety of walking across campus into an unknown building, into an unknown room, not knowing who's going to be there. So I feel like it's it's eased some things. Challenges have been, though, do a, does a student have, I mean, most college students have a device, right? So they have some basic laptop or tablet. But is that device capable of being on Zoom? Right? Does it have all of the capabilities necessary? Does it, is it up to date? I know mine wasn't. I was working from a Chromebook for, I'm still working from a Chromebook really. Um, but to, is their device capable of that? Uh, is their internet quality suitable, right? So are they going to encounter a lot of freezing? Are they gonna freeze a lot? Is everybody else gonna freeze? Can they be on camera um, with the bandwidth options? Um, so, so I think there's been some challenges and initially we worked with students around that. Our Dean of Students office on our campus was great for connecting students to the resources that they might need. You know, if their device was not capable of all of these things, how can we get them a device that is? What happens when the device breaks down, right? Because now it's been a year and oftentimes we run into some issues when we're using our devices over long periods of time like that. Many of our students were laid off from their jobs because restaurants had been shut down or the entertainment industry was shut down. Um, so they didn't have that source of income coming in as well. So really connecting them to resources on campus and resources in the community that could help them. Um, well, for us, you know, it was really about how we started collaborating with other partners, whether they're on campus, off campus, um, because there, it's like the missing piece for us and our students. It's like we are in the same place, but we're missing each other because they're going to different access points. Um, so as I mentioned, we are under the umbrella of counseling services and since things have gone digital for them as well, referrals have been a bit greater because it's just like, all right, now I don't have to, you know, overcome my entire stigma of walking into a counseling office. I can just, you know, set up a Zoom meeting and do it from my home and there I can learn about all sorts of new resources on my campus and get referred that way. Um, you know, being virtual has allowed us more accessibility to our student health center staff, to our, you know, just academic affairs staff, our accessibility resources offices, things like that. It's like we've been able to strengthen our collective efforts. Um, so it's now it's not, you know, uncommon to see campus rec and student health and us and counseling services doing a panel and answering questions. Um, and students actually showing up to that as well as, you know, coming to speak to us individually because now it's like, okay, I know I trust that resource, but now this resource trusts that one. So let's go see what they're about. Um, so I think that for us is the biggest thing when it comes to health equity because now it is openly available. If everyone's got an internet connection, it doesn't matter who they are. It's accessible, it's accessible, period. And that's what's been important. And, and I'll thank you for sharing that. And, and in the description for this program, I mentioned that less than 5% of campuses have collegiate uh, recovery support programs on their campuses. And we know that we have a, a, a great group of new uh, interested minds here today. So what tips would you share? What advice would you give for cap campuses that, aren't, that don't currently have these programs or beginning to think about and plan for these types of programs? What, what tips would you give them to consider as they're looking into development? We already heard one re, uh, great resource they can go to, uh, the, the AHRE website that they can look to for resources, but what other information would you share with them to start them on that process? Too many start, stars to pick from, go ahead. <laughs> start somewhere. Um, you know, don't, don't worry about where you start, just start. Uh, and you know, reach out to um, to any of us uh, because we are all in the Mid Atlantic region. And um, I think to tap into um, 
strength as alumni. So assuming that everyone here is an alumni of some institution, one of the things that I would suggest is that, you know, you look on their website, do a search on the ARHE website and see if your school has a program and if they're members. And if not, um, you know, contact your school because uh, and it, even if you're not a person in recovery, if you, you know, just feel so moved to advocate for this group and for this, um, for this mission, which, you know, would be just tremendous if you would do that. When I was at WVU um, with uh, Dr. Euro, when we started the first program, when we expanded our, um, our planning committee, and our advisory committee to include alumni, that got some attention because uh, the alumni that we had were very influential. We had uh, one person who was you know, part of our state count, uh, drug and alcohol counselor association who ran um, a treatment program in a major hospital in Charleston. We had uh, another individual who um, was the executive director of the Lawyers Assistance Program, and of course, you know, being the only law school in the state, uh, that got some some positive attention. He was also a very colorful uh, individual um, who has since passed. He was in his upper 80s when he would uh, be driving up and down 79 from Charleston to WVU to participate. Uh, and he played played music for us at our first couple of graduations. And, you know, so don't underestimate your influence as an alumni with your um, administrators because uh, they listen to alumni and, and pay attention. Um, so you have that, that capital that you can leverage on behalf of this marginalized population. Anyone else have some words of advice? Um, definitely. Oh, go ahead. That's what Susie said, you know, start somewhere definitely and influence is really important, whether it's, you know, well, I'm either at an institution and I want to, you know, do an assessment to see what the need is or just do a general meeting and see who shows up or, you know, talk to faculty or staff I know who are in recovery that want to do something for students, you know, ask them what they wish they had going through their, you know, experience. Or, you know, if you're not attached to an institution, you know, doing just what you are, be a part of, you know, your agency or your organization or whatever and approach an institution saying, hey, do you have one of these? And if not, you know, have you thought about starting one? Because for us, our advisory board, you don't get it unless you don't get on it unless, you know, you're one, very passionate about this and two, you know, we don't just kind of sit around reporting out whatever, all of us actively do something on our advisory board, whether that's showing up as a guest speaker for a smart recovery meeting or hosting you know, a student organization or referring someone or saying, hey, this department's got this initiative, I think we should collab. You know? So once again, don't underestimate your influence, even if you're not alumni, if you're just you know, a community partner that says, hey, we'd be stronger together. And by the way, if you have programs where you wanna talk about types of treatment, I'm in there or we can send a representative or we can send some information. Thank you for highlighting the importance of collaboration through this process, even at your, your, on your campuses and even beyond your campuses. So I think that's, that's great and very important to share. And also, um, uh, Susie, I'll also ask, I know that we've also included uh, in the materials, the slides are also included, but also a one page handout. Would you like to just describe what that one pager does uh, have included with it? I'm sorry, Rhonda. I've drawn a complete blank on what one okay. page. <laughs> I think it was Collegiate Recovery 101. It was a one pager document. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm sorry because we have a one pager for the network, and I was like, oh dear, I've completely forgotten what we're talking about. Um, are we able to bring that one pager up on the screen? So, ARH, ARH, you ARH can talk just about recently it. put mm -hmm. this together. Which, which screen? Uh, which slide were you talking about? It's not a slide. It's a separate one page. Uh, one it's a page one page handout. Graphic. And while she's talking, I'll see if I can, if I can get that. I was going to ask if, if any of my co-presenters had it handy. I would have to look through my downloaded photos to be able to, to bring it up. But it's a nice fact sheet. Um, just the, the short version is, is it's a nice fact sheet that was just recently put together um, by ARHE. And you know, so that's a good one to print out to share with people 
if you're going to begin this conversation at any point on your campus or with colleagues would be to print that out um, and then you know share that out and I'll, I'll work on getting that up and in the meantime i'm going to ask <laughs> um while we while we're working on pulling that up so um, in our last uh, few minutes here together, so it's been great that you've been able to pivot. All of you had some technology in place you were, and you, or you were able to pivot very quickly to adapting to technology. But we also know uh, that we'll be returning to campuses at some point. And so can you talk a little bit about what you see as how you will plan to continue to use this technology going forward um, while still maintaining your in-person program? At the University of Delaware, we'll definitely be implementing some amount of, of virtual services, just because it does break down the barriers that we've talked about. Um, and I think there's room for it. And I, I love Dr. CJ's idea about streaming things live on social media features, but much like Dr. Christine, we don't use a lot. We have social media accounts that we don't use. So perhaps um, tapping into them as well, so that way we can make our services even more accessible. I know for us, we will, you know, continue streaming things live, but also hopefully our school will keep the contract with Zoom because again, it's just a handy thing, handy thing to have, you know, when you're in between classes, but you don't want to, or you can't physically get there. It's like, you know, showing up somewhere too early or too late and having to turn around, you know, so it's like, I can wait outside my next class while I participate in this meeting. Okay, anyone else on that question? Well, I see we also had a question early on in the program. Um, we talked a little bit about evaluation and I've seen you chiming in on that as well. But I also saw a question early on about MOUD and how you're using MOUD at your programs. Um, so I see uh, Susie Mullins provided some information about that, but also just wanted to open that up to others to know if you're, how you're incorporating that into your programs as well. And if you have other questions in the chat, please do feel free to, to put those questions in the chat and we'll be able to uh, answer some of those. I'm so glad you circled back to that question because I think it's such an important question. The use of medication assisted recovery um, is another way we talk about it. And I think it's not nearly as available as I'd like to see it on, on our campuses. I know at Montclair State, we don't offer um, medication assisted recovery resources. We support our students who utilize medication assisted recovery. Um, but I think it's, and, and my colleagues can, can speak to this, I think it's highly underutilized in terms of um, campuses actually offering medication assisted recovery resources on our campus. I know I used to work at a school in, in Philadelphia. I used to work at Temple University and they, I believe still have the only addiction psychiatrist in their counseling center in the country. Um, there are a few other schools in the nation who offer medication assisted recovery, either through their counseling center or through their health center, but it's a very underutilized resource and it's something I'd really like to see expanded in, in the future. It's just, it's such a complicated discussion. Um, it, should, it shouldn't be that complicated, but it has become a complicated discussion unnecessarily. Um, so I really appreciate that, that question coming up. Yeah, and we provide all recovery meetings, as I'm sure a lot of the, the other folks on the calls programs do. But, um, you know, that is open to, you know, any pathway to recovery. So that can include medication assisted recovery and, you know, being funded by the state opioid response grants, you know, we are, are required uh, to support medication assisted treatment and recovery. Um, so I think that we have um, maybe not on our campuses specifically, but because our um, peers work for uh, comprehensive behavioral health centers, all of our comps have uh, people on staff that can prescribe medication assisted uh, treatment. Um, so, you know, those referrals can be pretty easily made. And I know that a couple of our campuses do have um, access to uh, FQHCs that are based on campus. So I think that there might be more available availability, um, but it's probably just not, not advertised. But I also appreciate that um, question being brought up. 
Agreed. Fantastic question. And I have to, again, agree with Dr. Christine that it is underutilized. There's a lot of stigma that can go along with medication-assisted recovery. Um, and with my answer in the chat, it, it really depends on the medication that a, a student is interested in, looking for more information on regarding where we send them. I know that our student health services has the ability to provide uh, prescriptions for certain medications, but not all. Uh, so I've also partnered with a number of treatment agencies in the area. I have visited them pre-pandemic. They know my face, they know my name, they have our information. And so that way I can give kind of a, a warm handoff uh, to different treatment agencies. You know, go and talk to this person, she's fabulous. Go talk to him, he's awesome. Um, and that makes that transition a little bit easier. So we do have a number of treatment agencies that we can partner with in the community as well. Great, thank you. I mean, you certainly all have shared a, a, a quite a bit of information and it, um, just to see the range of program opportunities. Um, so I, I just want to say but before we do close out, um, of course, an important part of these sessions is always our evaluation component. Um, so please do um, be sure to complete your evaluation for this session. There's been a great number, uh, deal of information shared. I've seen you in the chat asking for contact information. I have a feeling some of these programs will be getting calls to get, you're gonna serve as that starting program, as that starting point of, of reaching out to do that. Um, so certainly want to thank you for sharing the information. You can tell that all of our presenters have been very uh, amenable to sharing their contact information directly. And I also wanted to highlight that uh, Susie was able to drop that uh, uh, one pager document that can help you as you're uh, reaching back out to your campus communities to think about this program, that she's included that one page document. It's also included on the Vent Mobi website. So having said that, after giving that plug for that reminder, I do just wanna open it up to our panelists to see if there are any closing remarks that you'd like to share with the uh, group today or any final questions uh, before we close out as we come close to our time. I'd just like to thank everybody for coming to the session today. I'm glad that, that you all have much more information than you had an hour and 15 minutes ago, and appreciate you being with us, uh, especially through the lunch lunchtime. I'd like to add that um, just a way to find more about collegiate recovery and how what we do and how we what students we serve. Collegiate Recovery Day is coming up on April 15th. Um, I put a link for it in the chat. And encourage folks on Facebook, that's, you'll see a lot of action on, on April 15th, um, to just check it out and see what we're doing. So you have an idea of sort of how to get involved and how it serves our community. And for me, um, I love being in the brainstorming party. I love consulting with people, helping. So, you know, if you've got questions as well, how do I start this in the program? And as a Mid-Atlantic rep, it's what I'm here for. So if ever you want to just kind of, you know, huddle up and get some ideas, I'm all for it. Just shoot me an email. And I know it's a little bit soon, but not terribly too soon. Um, we will have our, uh, is it the 11th or 12th, Christine, National Conference? Uh, I've lost track. I think it's our 11th. I think it's the... Uh, or 12th. It's been, it's been a minute. It, yeah, uh, it's been, we've had a few. <laughs> <laughs> so our conference, our national conference is virtual this year. So there will never be an easier, um, less expensive way to access a, a, a ton of wonderful presentations, uh, networking opportunities and resources. And that's June 21st through 23rd or 24th. And you can find more information about that on the ARHE website too, which is collegiaterecovery.org. Great, well, we certainly thank all of our presenters for everything that you have shared today. Um, hopefully for those that were new to this topic, you have learned something in this hour and 15 minutes um, that you can then take back to start you on the journey for your campuses. We appreciate all of our speakers and we appreciate the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center for having us here today. Um, and please check out all those resources and links in the chat and then in the, uh, the, the event will be website. Um, you can find our speakers contact information there as well. And so having said that, I think we're ready to close out. You get one minute back in your afternoon. So thank you very much for joining. <laughs>